I have uh, open in front of me um, the world's bestseller, the ultimate bestseller, that being the Bible. And it is open to the very first page of the New Testament, which is also the first page of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, you can ask yourself, how do you think this best-selling book would open? What would its first words be? Well, let's read them and find out. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and so on. Yes, the opening lines of the most popular book in the world begins with a family tree, with the family tree of Jesus Christ, with Ancestry.com, a genealogical record, with, in other words, a list of names. And we might think, how, how is this supposed to be an attention getter? How would Matthew expect any of us to survive this list of names, which goes on for 17 verses, and, uh, and to whet our appetite to, to read the rest of the gospel that follows. Well, I want to show you that this list of names actually does generate excitement for us regarding the gospel message that follows it. Perhaps uh, we could we could um, understand how a list of names could do this by, by mentioning something like a blockbuster movie. People find out there's this big blockbuster movie coming out and, and there's this list of names of actors and actresses and and uh, and the studio that that is producing it and the director. And and when you see this list of names, people get all excited. Oh, so and so is playing in it. This is going to be an epic film. Have to see it. Why? What generated the excitement? It was a list of names of the people involved. Same with perhaps a book. If you're a book type of person, you open it up and you see what do you see? A list of names, people endorsing it. And they have PhDs after their names. And you think, wow, this is. This must be an amazing book. I really do want to read it because of this list of names. In a similar way, when we open our Bibles to the first page of the New Testament, we are encountered with a list of names. And believe it or not, this list of names can make us excited about the gospel that follows. So let me just show you a few amazing things about the gospel, the goodness of Jesus Christ that we can see because of this list of names. First of all, the gospel is historical. First of all, the gospel is historical. The term fake news is well known to all of us listening in right now. And perhaps there's quite a bit of fake news that gets distributed around our world. But Matthew is opening his gospel his account of these amazing happenings that took place in our world. And he's purporting not to write fake news, but to write history. In fact, one translation of this first verse gives it as the historical record of Jesus Christ. Matthew is going to make stupendous claims about the Lord Jesus and about what he's done for you and me and, and the promise of eternal life, but he roots it all in history. Notice, this isn't fake news. This is purporting to be history. But notice it's also not good advice. There's also many media outlets that that um, distribute quite a bit of what could be called good advice. And so there's talk shows and pop popular celebrities get on and they, they give good advice. They suggest we do this or that or try this diet and so on. But this is not good advice. This is good news. This is a record of something that has happened. And notice also when when we're talking about the gospel being historical, notice also that the very first words of the New Testament are not once upon a time in a land far, far away, right? This isn't a fairy tale. This, however, this gospel will offer us the very things we wish were true in fairy tales. The famous C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien talked about this, how many of us have within us this longing to live forever, to live in a perfect world, to connect with the animal kingdom in, in communicative ways that we are not able to now. We, we yearn for this. We long for this. That's why we return to these um, fairy tales and, and books like Lord of the Rings and so on. You see what the gospel does. The gospel comes to us in all seriousness and says, you know what? You can live forever. There is such a thing as eternal life. You can interact with the supernatural world. It's all coming. There's, there's a new heaven and earth coming. In other words, the gospel promises a fairy tale ending. They lived happily ever after. But it roots it in history. It roots it 
in a genealogical record of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that this list of names far from, well, it should far from make us bored. It should actually whet our appetite and say, could it be true? Could it possibly be true that all my longings could be rooted in a message of something that has historically happened and is real? Could it be true? Let me just um, let me just tell you about a group of people for whom this list of names really did open their eyes wide to the gospel. Uh, the story is told of Des and Jenny Oatridge. They were uh, Wycliffe Bible translators in, in the Binumerian people in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it talks about how Des, this Wycliffe Bible translator, translated the Gospel of Matthew, only to realize at the end that he had failed to do this very list of names that I'm talking about tonight. And so his wife sort of prodded him, you need to go back and translate those first 17 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. And a little bit begrudgingly, he did. And as he worked on it, the, the consultant who was helping him, who was a native of that people, that tribe, this consultant native, he, he responded in ways that he'd never responded to the rest of their translation work. His eyes grew wide and he said solemnly, we're having a meeting with everyone tonight. And so off he went, he arranged a meeting, and he asked Des to read the work that they had translated that day. And so Des begins to do so. He reads, these are the ancestors of Jesus Messiah, descendant of King David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah, and so on. And as he read, the people kept pressing in, and their eyes got wider and wider. So he, he kept on reading. He, he said, he got to the end of it. Mathen was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Messiah. There are 14 generations from Abraham to David and so on. He finishes off verse 17. And by this time, everything was quiet. People were pressed in very tightly against him. And Des was actually fearing for his life. He was afraid he had said something wrong and offensive. And the first person to respond said, why didn't you tell us this before? Another person chimed in and said, no one bothers to write down the ancestors of spirit beings. Another person said, it's only, it's only real people who record their genealogical table. Jesus must be a real person, someone said with ringing astonishment. You see, you see how this first point grabbed the eyes, the, the ears, and the attention of a whole group of people. They realized for the first time, Matthew is actually claiming that this Jesus Savior is real. This actually happened. This isn't just good advice, and it's not fake news, and it's not a fairy tale beginning in a land, land far away, once upon a time. Matthew is saying this actually happened on planet Earth. The Son of God took on flesh, became a man, died on the cross for sinners, and rose again. And it's historical. It actually happened. So that's the first thing, is this family tree, this list of names teaches us the gospel is historical. But just briefly, look at a second thing, and that is that the gospel is political. Notice that the first verse says that this Jesus is the son of David and the son of Abraham. To be the son of David is is to be in the kingly line of Israel. And uh, later when it gets to verse 6, it says that David is the king. Now, of all the other names in the whole genealogy, no other person's occupation is highlighted. It doesn't say uh, so-and-so the farmer and so-and-so the shepherd. It, only for David does it say his occupation, and that is that David is the king. And here is Jesus's family tree, this list of names, giving us these little hints that the gospel is political. Matthew weaves it right through this list of names, this emphasis, Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah, the Christ. You know, during election times, and I'm not going to speak very politically here, I'm a Canadian and I have no business talking about your politics down in the States, nor do you want to hear about ours up here in Canada, I'm sure. But you know, during elections, there are the people who can't be bothered at all and they don't put any signs on their yard. At least this is a Canadian thing, at least. But then there's the people that, you know, maybe they have a few signs. And then, and then there are the people whose lawns are riddled with political signs. And that's what Matthew's doing in this genealogy. 
time after time again, I won't take time to point them out. He leaves these little hints. It's like he's plastered uh, royal purple signs of the royalty of Jesus Christ all over his front lawn. He wants us to get the fact that the gospel is political. What do I mean? It means that the gospel is, annou is an announcement that Jesus Christ is the legitimate heir of the throne of David and that he is the legitimate ultimate Lord and ruler of all authorities on earth. So that the gospel is coming to us, not in a neutral way, but is actually calling for a response in which we submit to Jesus Christ, not only as our Savior, but as our King. And that our ultimate allegiance would be to him. The gospel message is a proclamation that Jesus died for sinners and rose again and has ascended up to heaven and is coming back one day to rule. So that if you become a follower of Christ, your ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ as Lord. And when he calls you after you're a Christian, he calls you to be baptized. He calls you to obey his teaching, not as a way to earn his salvation, but as an act of obedience to the one who already has saved you. The gospel is political. And I think that's good news. I think that's something to get excited about. Because, first of all, Jesus Christ as king tells us to submit to our earthly rulers. This isn't the case of um, Christians going rogue and, and throwing off all of the authority because Jesus Christ is our king. No, this is a king who says, all right, if you're going to obey me, then you need to be submissive and easy to get along with in your earthly governments. But secondly, it tells us that one day the, the world will be ruled by the one who gave up his power in heaven and came down and loved the lowly and reached out to the unreached and loved the outcast. In other words, the gospel announces that one day we will experience a world in which the one who will be at the absolute top is the one who became a slave, who was lowly and humble and gentle, and who loves all, and his reign will be perfect and righteous. And so we're, we're carrying on then. The gospel is historical. The gospel is political. We're, we're looking at Jesus's family tree. It's Christmas time. Let's go to the third point. The third thing that this list of names gets us excited about the gospel is this. The gospel is controversial. The gospel is controversial. What do I mean? Well, here's a very curious thing. As you work through this list of names, and I realize we're not reading it out loud, you can take a moment to do so at home. But as you work through this list of names, you realize that there's a whole bunch of really amazing godly women who are sort of heroines in the Old Testament that this list of names does not bother to mention. It doesn't talk about Sarah or Rebecca or Rachel, for instance. But there are some ladies whose names are mentioned. And here's the thing. All of them, in some way or other, are linked with sexual scandal. Now, I want to be very quick to say the Bible, in many of these cases, doesn't blame the women for the sexual impropriety. Some of them, I mean, Rahab, for instance, is listed here, and she was a professional prostitute. And I, I will move on shortly here, everyone. But I just, I think it's important to point this out. Why? Why doesn't he mention all these godly ladies, but he mentions some whom we could call shady ladies? Why? It's almost as if Matthew, in addition to plastering his front lawn with signs of royal purple announcing the political reign of Jesus Christ, it's almost as if, in addition to that, Matthew is deliberately putting out the dirty laundry. The, the stories that we want to rush over, the stories that we maybe don't want to read out loud when we gather together in a church setting. We don't want the children to hear this. Why? Because it's, it's, it's a little bit shady. There's some dirty laundry here. And it's almost as if Matthew's excited to highlight these ladies. It's almost as if he's saying this is something that makes the gospel attractive. And listen, dear friends. He's absolutely right. Here's the controversial message of the gospel. It's this. God is kind to bad people. This is the message of the gospel. That God loves sinners. Right? And um, in various ways, Matthew highlights, for instance, how David sinned 
and I won't go into it, but it involved murder and adultery. He, he doesn't cover it up. Many a book has written in the last few years to try and, and pretend as if the church has, has had to do cover-ups and hide embarrassing parts of our history, but the, the actual gospel documents themselves don't do that. It's as if gospel, Matthew is, is putting that right in front of our eyes, that the Lord Jesus was born into a line of people with a really shady past. Why? Because Matthew wants to show us this is what the gospel is all about. The gospel is not that good people who live a good life and have a good family and obey the good rules and go to a good church, that they end up in a good place at the end of life. That's not the gospel message. This is probably the most misunderstood thing about the gospel. And here in the very first page of the New Testament, Matthew sets the record straight. The gospel is not for good people. The gospel is an offer of hope and salvation and forgiveness and cleansing for people with a really shady past. It is the gospel for shady people, for sinful people. And the person that you are speaking to needs this gospel more than anyone else in the world. I am a sinner, but I rejoice in the message of the gospel that the apostle Paul announced when he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You and I are sinners. As much as we might try to be the best people we can be, we fall short of our own standards as well as everyone else's, and we certainly fall short of God's perfect standard who can have no sin in his presence or family or home. And God is holy. And he reacts very negatively towards the evil that is in our heart and our sin. But at the same time, he reacts in absolute love. And the gospel message is that he has found a way to write himself into the story of history. And the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, became man and lived a perfect life that we could never live and went to the cross and died for sinners in the place of sinners. Jesus Christ became the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. There on the cross, the Lord Jesus was treated for all the bad things that you and I have done. He took our punishment. He took the place of sinners died our death, and rose again so that we could get what he deserves. That's the gospel message, that God has shown his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel message, that the righteous one, the Lord Jesus, died for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Well, I'm so thankful for this family tree. I'm, I'm so thankful for the rest of the gospel that follows after this list of names, where it tells out the wonderful story that the God who is so holy is also the God who is so loving. And he's provided his own son to be the substitute that we needed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you prepared to admit that you're one of the sinners for whom he had to come and rescue? Are you prepared to admit along with so many other Christians, people who've already become Christians, that so sinful is your heart and so sordid is your record that there is no amount of good works or personal change or New Year's resolutions that can make it all suddenly disappear, that the only solution for you, the only hope you could possibly have is if it was true that God's own son lived a perfect life and died for those who have fallen short of the glory of God. That's the gospel message. God loves and is kind and is prepared to freely forgive and save sinful, evil, wicked people like me. And if you are willing to admit yourself to be a sinner for you. Well, there's just a few things, but let me come to two more things that Matthew's list of names is actually meant not to send us away and say, I don't, I'm not interested in the gospel. Actually, this list of names is meant to excite us about the gospel. And we have seen that the gospel is historical. It actually happened. And that it's political. 
and that it's controversial. It's all about grace. It's all about God welcoming sinful people into his family and forgiving them. Not because of anything they've done, but because of what Christ has done. But, but just look briefly at this one. The gospel is supernatural. The gospel is supernatural. All this talk about these shady ladies leads us to the fifth woman that's mentioned in the genealogy, and that's Mary, the virgin mother of Christ. And um, Matthew, all the way through this list of names, he mentions these men who fathered so-and-so, and and he's tracing Jesus's kingly family line, which um, is his credentials, as it were, for, for claiming the throne of his father David. It's showing that he's a legitimate son of David. But, but, at the end of the genealogy, it takes a, a strange twist. And, and so it says, Eliad is the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer is the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph. But, but look at what happens next. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, and the word whom in Greek is feminine, meaning Matthew is saying of Mary, was Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And what Matthew is hinting at in his very careful wording in this list of names, he then spells out concretely in the following verses. And that is this, that before Mary and Joseph came together in a sexual way, Mary the Virgin supernaturally conceived Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew is saying, yes, the gospel is historical and it's political and it's controversial, but it's also supernatural it's also supernatural here's the amazing claims i know many of us modern people and we're somewhat scientific in our background and education we think this is impossible but but given the existence of god which for many people is not that hard to believe in given the existence of god the miraculous is possible Someone I heard a preacher recently, Stephen Vance, speaking, and he pointed out that, I mean, according to the first page of Genesis, the entire universe is created out of nothing by the word of God. And here we come to the first page of the New Testament, and it says the Lord Jesus took on flesh and became a man by the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in Mary. The gospel says we need a savior who is a man, who is a human being. We need a human to die for us. To pay the price that humans deserve to pay. But that human who must pay the price for us, he cannot be merely human. He certainly cannot be sinfully human. For if he is sinfully human, then anything he pays, he can only pay for himself. And Matthew presents us the wonderful news that God has found a way for his own son to become incarnate, to be genuinely and truly human, yet without the agency of a human father. So that that sin nature, that taint of sin that has been passed on from generation to generation, all from the first human couple till now, did not pass on into Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one who did no sin, who has no sin, in him is no sin, who committed no sin. He was perfectly righteous and holy. The gospel is supernatural. Jesus was conceived of a virgin. The gospel is supernatural. After he died, he rose again three days later as a matter of historical fact. And he's declared to be the son of God in power. This is all being pointed forward to by Matthew's list of names. But I want to finish what might be for you the most exciting aspect. And that's this. The gospel is personal the gospel is personal here we have an account of the son of god jesus christ the the very creator of us the one who is truly god the one for whom all things were made the one who's the actual author of this book the bible guess what he does he writes himself into the story He writes himself into the script and gives himself the hardest role, the humblest role, the most painful role. He gives himself the role of savior, of lamb, of God, of sacrifice. 
He has written himself into history. He has written himself into the human family. He has become one of us, Emmanuel, God with us. But listen, having died on the cross for sinners, having risen again three days later, do you know what Jesus does now? The Lord Jesus Christ turns to you and me and he says, listen, this gospel is personal. If you will receive me, you can have yourself written into my story. The the Gospel of John says that as many as received him, God gave them the right to become children of God. Jesus has written himself into our story. He's become part of the human family tree. But now, having died for us and risen again, he turns to us and says, listen, there's an opportunity now for you to become part of my family tree. If you will receive me, Jesus Christ, says Jesus, if you will receive me as your Savior, as the Christ, the true King, as the Lord of your life, if you will receive me in this way by faith, you will become a child of God. You will become part of my family. For all those who do receive him, God immediately forgives and pardons you of all your sin and does a wonderful work of regeneration in your heart, whereby you are birthed into the family of God. And the destiny of Jesus Christ becomes yours as well. This, my friends, is is the family tree, the list of names that begins not only Matthew's gospel, but the whole New Testament. It shows us that the gospel is historical. These things really happened. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. There were witnesses. You can investigate it. It says the gospel is political. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, Lord of the universe. It says the gospel is controversial. Jesus Christ died for sinners. The message of the Bible is there's hope for people who've done wicked things and are willing to confess their sins to him and trust in him. The gospel is supernatural. Jesus literally did, was conceived of a virgin and rose again on the third day. And the gospel is personal. Jesus Christ is inviting you now to receive him, to trust in him. Listen, if you did, if you did, it would be a very Merry Christmas for you. A Christmas of joy, unlike any other Christmas before. I'm facing a Christmas where I am, where we're going to be shut down and separated from our family. But I belong to Jesus Christ's family. I am a child of God, not because of any good thing I've done but because of simple faith of reliance upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.